Hey everyone, Nick Green here. This is part two of a two-part series on unleashing performance, a scientific approach to health benefits and gains inside and out the box. So last week's episode was about unleashing performance outside of the box, and this week's performance, or this week's episode, will cover unleashing performance when you get to the gym, when you get inside the box. Again, the box is what us CrossFit folks call the gym. So, um, again, this episode is a um, it's a second part of the presentation that I gave at my CrossFit gym, uh, Three Kings Athletics, just uh, uh, a week ago now. Um, and so I had a whole slide deck presentation that I'll be uh, speaking from today. So go ahead and uh, find the clip on YouTube, and you can go ahead um, and follow along with the slides. But uh, Anyway, let's just jump into it. So now the importance here is that uh, when we talk about fitness goals, health behavior change, oftentimes we kind of jump to right what's happening inside the gym. So a lot of the times what happens is first there's just getting started is hard enough, right? Getting to the gym, how do we how do we arrange our environment to evoke the most um, desirable behaviors when it comes to um, meeting our fitness goals, but eventually when we get there, now my examples and uh, some of the different buckets I'll be speaking to are going to you know, be very specific to some of the functional fitness movements and programming, but um, they can really be applied to any type of you know, preferred physical activity, exercise, sport, and so on. So I'm just speaking from my experience, um, but uh, you know, when we go into any type of movement practice, any type of um, exercise, you know, there's going to be frustration here. There's going to be, you can't just get a pull-up. You know, you, you might be frustrated with some gymnastics movement like a, a ring muscle-up or a bar muscle-up. Sometimes you can't. Uh, you're having trouble with uh, your Olympic lift, the snatch, or maybe you're, there's some mobility issues with your overhead squats. Um, you might be unsure of your inf- of the infect. Blah. You may be unsure of the effectiveness of your current programming or the cycle that you're on, so... Many times the format of any type of uh, group fitness training class, you kind of just show up, you kind of go with the flow, and for most people that's good enough, but for those of you listening where you want a little bit more, you want to know where the programming is headed, you want to know how it's hitting um, you know, your squat performance, you want to know where you're headed, um, there can be some strategies that allow us to go ahead and evaluate how well our programming is. So naturally we might have some frustration of, you know, I've been through various training cycles myself where you're just, um, you know, it could be this a four to six week uh, um, training cycle where it's, you know, you're increasing the load each week and then you have a deed load week and you just want to um, evaluate, you know, what we're doing because you're putting in a lot of work and just having that little extra piece of communication helps you understand, you know, where your training is heading. And um, that's really what it's all about. You know, we're, 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 we're exercising we're changing a lot of behavior when it comes to disrupting our home life, you know, trying to achieve that work, home, exercise, life balance, right? Um, there's, depending on where you are in your training and your exercising, um, you know, we just need those little nuggets. We need to know that we're heading in the right direction because all these benefits that we're achieving, they're going to be very long, delayed, and um, really kind of unknown, right? And what I mean by that is... Um, as we all know that you know, strength training, cardiovascular training is good, but it's going to take years for us to really develop that kind of that core engine and that 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 base set of strength to really you know see those benefits, right? So really, it comes down to I just have on the slide here. You you can just you you're just going to get frustrated with any just kind of fill in the blank answer. I gave examples with specific movements um, as they relate to functional fitness, but you can be frustrated with really anything, and I've. I've heard it time and time again with, um, you know, new fitness, n- new clients that I'm working with. Um, they're frustrated with, um, you know, I've, 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 I've started with a six week cycle and then I just kind of stop and fall off, right? I, I, um, I start for, I, I'm on a program for six months and that's it. And, um, you know, I thought that this gym was going to be good or I even just met a, actually I met a couple at, um, at the gym that I presented a week ago and they were frustrated with there's a, a local would just say it's like a franchise gym that you know they're good to get them in the gym but then once they got there the programming fell off the coaching wasn't great um 
the workouts weren't challenging anymore. So they were just frustrated with just a host of different things. And so naturally they, you know, kind of, they found our gym and they were happy. And, um, yeah, so there's just, just many layers of frustration there. And when, you know, if you put your sales and marketing hat on once you, um, and when any of these kind of key pieces fall off, that quality falls off, customers, athletes, clients, they're going to look elsewhere for those to meet, you know, to have their needs met. So really, when it comes down to it, you ask yourself, are there certain areas that you want to improve upon? Again, we're talking about unleashing performance inside the box. Um, you know, my, my, my playground, my sandbox is inside the gym, the four walls. But again, these ideas, these principles can be applied to, you know, any type of uh, exercise programs that, you know, there's plenty of track, plenty of track and field athletes out there. There's plenty of Ironmen, triathletes, um, you know, marathoners that, uh, whatever your sandbox is, you just think about what areas you want to improve there. So, um, for me, again, drawing from my, my CrossFit background, there's a whole definition here that, um, you know, I, I imagine most exercise programs have something, you know, similar to it, but CrossFit hangs their hat on, you know, having a good diet, practicing and training, major lifts, um, different skills, different exercises, different sports. You mix and vary those elements, and then you just learn new sports, and that's going to give you a good, you know, kind of base of just general fitness and, and general preparedness. So just there's the one piece that I kind of saw that um, I think my background in training and behavioral science kind of supplements is that, sure, we have these definitions, and, you know, it's, as long as you show up, that's great, but I think there's a lot, there's, there's, there's just some room for some opportunity here where, you know, there's no roadmap here, so we're 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 doing everything we're we're showing up but it's really kind of hard to tell what what the missing piece is so our progress is stalling we're hitting plateaus when it comes to you know setting personal records on lifts um and really your ongoing development of, of your fitness is unclear right for example you could say yeah i've been going to i've been going to spin class every you know for five years and i think i'm getting better i don't know i think my, my heart rate you know i get my heart rate up high pretty you know pretty good every week. Uh, I go to CrossFit every week. Um, I think I'm getting stronger. I don't know. You know, so there's a lot of, a lot of unknowns when it comes to mapping our goals onto what's, you know, what's happening on the day to day. So it's really, it's, it's just a matter here of a question of, of how do we take our training to another level? And I think that's where my background in training and behavior analysis is, uh, you know, is, is one way to address those problems. So Behavior analysis is simply the science of, of improving human performance. And when it comes to health and fitness, that human performance piece is going to be all of those behaviors, all those behavior change elements that relate to going to the gym, getting to the gym. When you, when you, are, when you are at the gym, what are you doing there? How effective is it? So on and so forth. So just as a brief disclaimer, right? I think we all can agree that gravity keeps us on Earth on the behavioral principles, they exist just like gravity. So it's not a matter of if, how, and when reinforcement will work for fitness, if motiv- motivating operations will work for fitness. It's not a matter of if there are punishing consequences, if there's a matter of you know stimulus control. I'm saying more technical jargon here, but there are behavioral principles at play, so it's just a matter of us arranging the environment, changing the contingencies, uh, contriving new situations to really uncover what could be happening, right? So, and we'll get into that as we as we kind of move through this part two here. So now, the foundation of most of my programming, coaching, that when I work with clients, at any type of skill that we may be working on, it's going to come down to four pieces here. Foundation is we have to, one, pinpoint what we want to look at. And this is probably one of the most important areas to look at when it comes to changing health and fitness programs. So we need to be very specific about what what we want to change. Sure, we want to feel better in our clothes. Sure, we want to feel better. We, we want to be better role models for our kids. Sure, we want to, you know, have, you know, we want to be healthy. We want to, um, we want to have enough energy to play with the grandkids. All those things are great, but we need to be specific about what those health behaviors are that we need to change. So the pinpoint, comma ones, right? I've been talking about it previously on many podcasts, blogs, videos, is that step counts, attendance to the gym, 
all those types of measures. We'll get into more specific ones here in this episode, but pinpointing being specific about what those physical activities are that you want to change is, is clear. Then step two is, as, a, as a follow-up is measurement. So we have pinpoint and then measurement. How are we going to measure that activity? Because once we have those things, those two elements are going to allow us to decide if we are headed in the right direction, right? Which takes us to step three. Then we need constant feedback, reinforcement to know if what we're doing is correct, right? So we have, we, if we take weekly step counts on average, how are we doing? Are we getting those 10,000 steps? Okay, you need some type of feedback, whether it's yourself reviewing the, the steps on your iPhone or working with a coach like myself, you're going to look at those steps, you're going to get feedback. Sure, you can do it, but when you have somebody else giving you that feedback, that's another element of behavior change. That's another element of behavioral principles working um, for or against your health goals. And then, of course, reinforcement. We want to provide some type of feedback to then increase the odds that those activities will happen again. So we have pinpoint measurement, feedback, and reinforcement. And then we want to be in a constant state of reevaluation. So it's it's great that we have those first three pieces set up, but then we need to be in that constant looking back, looking back in how our decisions are moving along. And so that's really what it comes down to. You know, I've spoken before about making those fitness decisions are are, are paramount to to, uh, to making sure that you're constantly on the right track. So again, those four steps, pinpoint, measurement, feedback, reinforcement, and reevaluation. So now when it, when it comes to me working with clients, I've kind of bucketed, there's three different areas about, or three different areas in which we can um, analyze and enhance our performance inside the gym. Area one, more movement. Area two, you can learn and develop new skills. And area three, we can analyze our programming. And I'm going to walk through each of these steps now, or each of these areas now. So area one, more movement, right? So if we need to unleash performance inside the box, it could be as simple as what does more movement look like for you? What does more movement look like for your friend? What does more movement look like for the new person walking in the door, right? I used to work in a sales setting um, for a gym, so I sold gym memberships, a lot of fun. Some people walk in, they don't know what to do at all, right? They just know that, okay, I'm going to go to this gym location. There's going to be some knowledgeable people there, and they need to help me out. So um, what does more movement look like for you? And this is going to be individualized, right? It could be increased gym attendance. I just said that, right? If I'm coming from a baseline of not working out, at all, you know, for the past six months, carving out that time, just counting that one for the day, that two for the day, that three days of the week in the gym, maybe that's what more movement's going to look like. And then you start breaking down from there. Okay, you get to the gym, but when you get there, are you watching TV or are you on the treadmill? When you get there, are you on the treadmill? Okay, great. Are you going fast enough? You start introducing this gradual shaping process, but you can't get to you know, 10,000 steps without even getting to the gym first. So more movement, again, this is kind of, you know, this kind of hits the spectrum of activities that we're going to be discussing here, but it could just be as simple as showing up to the gym. Um, what does more movement look like, right? If we get to the gym, we we, we, um, we attend these intense cardio classes. Um, more minutes could, more movement could be more minutes engaged at a higher heart rate. So that's kind of the key with most health benefits is that we need to spend um, a certain amount of minutes and the, the general guidelines um, for health benefits are 150 minutes per week of moderate vigorous physical activity. So any type of you know strenuous strenuous activity that elevates your heart rate above your baseline. So um, here on the slide, um, my gym has a has a, a group fitness class called Beats Fitness in which everybody wears heart rate monitors and you get that constant feedback of um, you know, when you're on the bike or the rower, you need to make sure that your heart is elevated to capture that more intense movement. So we have increased gym attendance, more move, more minutes engaged. Um, you could have something more movement specific, like you could have, um, when it comes to the topography of movement, you could be looking at more steps, or you could be looking at more repetitions, right? More movement could be more, um, more squats out of a chair, right? If it's a maybe it's a fitness program for for seniors, then they just need to spend more time getting up and up up and down out of their chairs, um, so on and so forth. So um, here on the slide, I have a uh, just an example of a client that I'm currently working with, in which our target, our movement, our activity was targeting 
the number of intensity minutes per week. Um, this client has an Apple Watch. Many of us are Apple users who are listening. Um, there's a movement ring that captures um, intensity minutes, and so we just grab that total each week and add it up. So on the x-axis, we have from June 2019 up to February 2020, and we see that really the average um, physical activity intensity minutes was about, doing the math here, it looks like it's about 140 during those months. But what happened was we determined, uh, we figured out a good uh, fitness program that my client wanted to attend. And as soon as we introduced that, that was a kickboxing class that she attended three to four times a week since October. So I drew a line there and we see that average is really, it went up to, um, I'd say the average about 250 a week over the net, the, you know, the past five months. So nearly a doubling of physical activity minutes is that, and that's just something that we looked at. Again, we pinpointed the activity, um, looking at or pinpointed what we wanted to measure, pinpointed that that behavior, which was intensity minutes. Uh, this was weekly feedback, um, and I provided social reinforcement, and then we reevaluated. And that reevaluation piece was key to getting us to a point where we could um, really uh, be confident about the decisions that we're making related to her physical activity and um, fitness. So that was area one. Area two, just had to get a quick sip of coffee here. Area two uh, could be you want to learn and develop new skills. So now unleashing performance as it relates to sometimes you just can't perform the skill. So what do you do, right? Um, the question here that I had for the audience is how many skills do you need to be good at CrossFit? CrossFit has many movements. Um, uh, you can think about tough mutters. You can think about, um, you know, just even the triathlon. You have to be good at swimming, running, and biking. You have to be fairly efficient at those you have to you have to know how to ride a bike. You have to know how to get on and off the bike, right? That's uh, that's something I know when I catch the uh, the Iron Man that's in uh, on you know that's in Hawaii that's on TV. They always talk about that that transition time, that in and of itself, transitioning from the swim to the bike, the bike to the run, putting on your shoes, taking off your shoes. All those little skills add up to you know um, faster times, um, reduced reduced errors, things like that. So. Um, how many skills do you need to be good, right? If, again, if we're thinking about the functional fitness, if you've ever seen it on TV or ever been to a gym yourself, those crazy athletes are doing so many different things between, um, you know, the Olympic lifts, the wall balls, the push-ups, the body weight exercises, the lunges with different objects, with dumbbells, without dumbbells. You have, um, you, you have sleds, you have barbells, you have all these things. So even if you're just looking at the CrossFit Foundation on movements, you have a lot of skills to learn, right? You have the squats, the presses, the deadlifts, the, the cleans, the gymnastics moves, all these things, right? So um, with uh, even with um, with running, that's a very complicated movement, even though you're just kind of running forward. Like, okay, how many steps you need to do you need to know to learn how to run? We're just one foot in front of the other, but but if you go extra, if you go ask all the exercise science folks, all those uh, kinesthetic scientist folks out there they can they can t really tell you how to break down the, uh, the run the stride link all all those things like that so really when it comes down to any movement you think about how simple or how complex something is so you have you have simple skills as say pull up push up sit up uh, running sled push sled pull i know i just said running was complicated and i have it listed on my my simple skills uh, side but you know that's the general idea you have some really basic simple movements right but you also have complex movements such as the Olympic lifts. There's certain powerlifting movements. I've talked about muscle ups many times on this uh, podcast. You have handstand walks, double unders with the jump rope. So a double under is uh, you jump one time and the rope passes under your feet twice. Uh, that is a very complicated movement because it requires a lot of timing, a lot of endurance, um, and there's a specific uh, you know pattern you want to uh, uh, you want to you know spin your wrists at to uh, make sure that you are consistently hitting that you know that right cadence when it comes to uh, jumping rope so you have just a good sampling right so you know where do you begin well when you're learning a new skill just like our our pinpoint measurement feedback and reinforcement what you want to do you have four steps here you want to select a skill break down all the steps track those steps and evaluate your progress and so now here is where I have an example um, with the push-up so um, this might be helpful to look at the slides um, after you listen to this, but, um, if you're watching the video, welcome. 
Uh, so the example here, the question to ask is how many steps are there to a strict push-up? Now, strict meaning um, you're not you're not uh, using any momentum, you're keeping your body rigid and uh, tight, and all that's moving are, are your shoulders and your arms, right? That's producing the force for you to go from the top position to the bottom position. Now, when I ask this question um, uh, to to the folks in the presentation. I got the answer that I was kind of looking for, which was, oh, there's only two steps. You, you go down, you go up. And I said, aha, what if we broke it down a little further? And now from the slides here, I kind of, I broke it down um, from a book a book called the Su- Becoming a Supple Leopard by uh, Kelly Starrett, who's pretty much like the godfather of, of movement and mobility. So he broke it down into, fi- into five steps, in which you have the setup, the top position, the lowering mid-range position, pushing up mid-range position, top position, um, two. So he has those five steps. Now what I did is I broke the, broke down those five steps into, into other steps. So now there's really, you go from two steps from down up to five steps to really what I saw was there's 17 steps in a push-up, which is just like, what? How do you get there? So um, the steps here I have listed during the setup, you have you have to kneel down. You know, this is just getting into the push-up position, which can be difficult. Again, depending on where you are in your skill development um, kind of journey, um, these steps can be very important to, you know, really capture, you know, how to evaluate your progress and unleash that performance. So the setup requires you to kneel down on your knees, put your hand shoulder width apart, right? We've seen people that have uh, their, their their hands are too narrow or too far. There's different goals there, of course, or different types of push-ups. But in general, we're talking about the basic, you know, strict push-up. You want your fingers pointed forward. You got to step your legs back, put your feet together, squeeze your glutes. So those are one, two, three, four, six steps just for the setup. You haven't even moved yet. And now in the top position, you want your shoulders over your hands. You know, you want to screw your shoulders in, your, your pits of your elbows forward. So you want to be tight, nice and rotated. That's for the top position. Then, then you actually get into the push-up movement where you're lowering your body down, your weight is centered, not going left or right. Your belly's tight, your butt's tight. You, then you push back up. Then you're pushing back up. Again, you can have butt tight, belly tight, and then the top position, you're going to be tight again. So, you know, again, maintaining strength and stability through the entire motion um, is essential of doing a nice, strict push-up because we all know if we've seen... People get fatigued, their hips sag, their butts in the air, um, they're not in a plank position, their arm, you know, one arm is stronger than the other, so they're kind of swaying side to side. So when you have all these 17 steps um, all, you know, firing in the right order, completing all those steps, you can see, um, you know, you can easily point out if you're in the gym, like, oh man, they're missing steps five, six, and seven, they're sagging their hips, and that then there's areas of opportunity to go ahead and help imp- improve their training with other maybe supplemental exercises. Um, but what you do is here now, for looking at this from a behavioral lens, what I just described here, this is called a task analysis. You broke down one task, one complicated movement, the push-up, look at all of, looked at all of its core components, and then what we're going to do next is I have it all shown on an Excel sheet here, is that you're going to count which steps you got right, which steps you got wrong, look at that percentage, and then just look at that over time. So um, I have, I'm going to have five trials set up here. I coded it green. These are just hypothetical. Let's say you get, you can kneel down, your shoulder, your hands are shoulder width apart. Maybe you're missing, your fingers aren't pointed forward. Maybe they're sideways. But again, you go through all 17, these, 17 of these steps. You count them up. Let's say trial one, you get eight out of 17. So you get 47% of the steps right. So this is, you know, measuring the quality of the movement. So you're not even half right when it comes to this movement. So this is how we're starting to break down these steps. Trial two, let's say you miss one extra step. You get seven out of 17 and then 10 out of, you know, seven again, then 10 and 12. And you can do these trials. Um, You could do these maybe like once a week. You could do these once a month. But essentially what we want is just kind of initial, you know, some type of probe, some type of quick in, quick out, get a pre-post, right? You're just going to get a you know, all these routine measurements, I think it makes sense to probably look at these maybe like one time on a weekly basis, you know, so again, that kind of gets into actually how to, how to, you know, how to um, decide that cadence, but, um, you know, once a week's probably good if you're taking this amount of data. Um, 
But over time, you see those percentages there, and um, you know if you have it on a grid like this, you can see, you know, what where do the problem areas? You can quickly see it versus like. Oh, I don't know if you know, I can't remember if you, you you know how your elbows were two weeks ago. I can't remember if uh, you were if your fingers were pointed in the right direction. This quick this quick snapshot looking at it like this tells you right away. Okay, the two areas you know if I'm a coach or if I'm looking at my own data, the two biggest problems I have is keeping my belly tight and keeping my shoulders screwed in together. And you can see that through the red boxes, the green boxes. I know how to set up when I'm kneeling down on the knees. I know how to keep my belly tight. You know, I can I can start pushing up, right? So this is a nice visual. Green steps, we got it. Red steps, we've got to work on it. And so now I love I love to use line graphs. So what you do is you just plot these percentages um, over time. So you got five trials on the x-axis, percentages on the y-axis, and then we just break the we break the uh, break the line between trials three and four, and let's just say. Um, uh, you have uh, a program change, so now we can see if, uh, let's say, Coach Nick here is actually doing any good. So we could say, okay, first three trials, uh, about 50%. Trials four and five, average about 70%. So, you know, maybe maybe my coaching is helping out. So we can just start evaluating things that way. So big takeaways from area two here. You know, first area was general more movement, but area two, you know, the focus here is really going to be on movement quality, what should be taught first, right? So... Um, there could be a, a specific order that's important to, um, you know, new skills that you're learning. Maybe you, you need to you need to learn things in a specific order. You know, steps one through five have to be taught and learned before steps, you know, six through 17. Um, break, breaking down movements um, can reveal missteps, right? So you can um, plot your 17 steps, plot your 10 steps, you know, check it off on a clipboard, and you can say like, whoa, wow, I didn't realize that you missed, you know, step nine every time. Let's Let's look at that step, right? Um, when it comes to, you know, implementing different, not implementing, but just deciding on whether or not to do a, a, uh, you know, a scaled movement, which is, uh, basically you can't do the movement as prescribed in a workout. So maybe you can't do strict pu push ups. So maybe you, you have to, you can do, uh, you know, push ups, uh, you know, against the wall. Um, if you progress too fast into a, pro a you know, an RX movement, a prescribed movement, you're going to, you know, you're likely going to compromise the quality of your movement. So there's going to be, um, you know, there's a cost benefit there. So um, the utility here is, um, I think, if you are going about this in a, a systematic way, you know, let's say you get, you know, let's say there's three major progressive steps to getting a, a pull up, you know, let's not move on to version, you know, variation two until you master variation one, and you can't move on to variation three until you master Variation two with variation three being, you know, that strict pull up. So there's a lot of utility there in helping you decide um, how quickly to move through certain programs, what what movements to try, and really it's all about seeing being systematic and doing things, you know, um, in a confident way. And um, you know, there's plenty of injuries that happen out there. This could be a useful tool for um, preventing injuries. You know, sometimes uh, you may uh, you may put too much weight on the barbell too fast following an injury, um, or may, I've learned it before that I maybe pulled too hard, um, you know, rounded my back during the deadlift, and so um, following certain steps, following a certain load progression could help prevent those types of injuries. So that's area two. Now we're going to move on to area three, which is program evaluation. Um, and here, the big question is, okay, you've been working hard, you've been starting, you know, you could have just, again, you're working on more movement, or you're you know, you're a sophisticated amateur to elite athlete, how do you know that your program is working, right? That's the question. You know, what improves? Um, I just have a list here of different um, activities, different movements, different exercises, and specifically to the functional fitness world, like a certain workout time improves. Um, there's a workout called Fran in which you do a thruster, which is a, which is a, a clean to an overhead, and then you could do pull-ups at a 21, 15, 9 cadence where you do 21 thrusters, 21 chest bar or sorry 21 pull-ups and then you do 15 thruster 15 pull-up 9 thruster 9 uh, 9 pull-up and uh, the the professional athletes they can do this exercise in like sub two minutes like that's always kind of like the the eureka goal the, the promise lane goal right so that probably takes me like i don't know nine ten minutes to do this I haven't done it in a while, but um, all these times, all these exercises, they, they improve. You got your back squat. You can do certain activities, you know, with that pr that prescribed uh, 
recommendation versus a scale. You can do more unbroken push-ups. You can do more unbroken pull-ups. You can finally do that double under. You can finally do that muscle up. So all these things, right? So, you know, across the board, most of the time, you know, most programming works, but there's cases now in which you want to know that, okay, something's not working. So how do we know what to do next? Right? So what do you look at? Where do you begin? Well, you know, here I have a picture of, you know, different, different uh, logos of uh, different software companies that help track, you know, CrossFit data. I'm sure the same things, you know, there's plenty of software companies and, uh, you know, weightlifting, um, you know, running, there's t tons of running apps, right? I, I ran last summer. So I used the Nike Run Club app, which is great. So we have plenty of sophisticated apps, you know, Watt Hopper, Wattify, Beyond the Whiteboard. I have a picture of um, my logbook, so I would always write down my workouts, keep track of that. So really the question is, we have the data, but what do we do with it? And that's, that's the challenging piece in what you need kind of a trained eye to look at. Okay, how are we going to pick out something important and look at how well the program has served us? So we find direction in aligning all of our data with our goals, right? So we we have to think about what is our ultimate fitness outcome? What are we trying to achieve in the long term? And then what are my relevant training targets as they relate to, you know, meeting those outcomes? So just through a couple examples here, we look at, um, you know, so this is a, a friend of mine that I worked with down in Gainesville. So uh, the, tr the ultimate outcome was uh, he just wanted to feel less burned out. He was working hard, a young kid, doing lots of volume. Uh, had a, he was following a very specific training. Um, so what we looked at is just his training volume and what we had to do was look at his weekly, uh, his weekly lifts, his weekly totals. And so what we did was, um, we have a graph here. We looked at his training volume each week. So we have weeks on the bottom from week one to week, uh, 28 on the, on the X axis here. And then on the Y axis, we had weight in pounds. And so what you'll see on the graph here is we had a big spike in the, and the Y axis goes from zero pounds to 90,000 pounds. So um, this is how many weekly pounds he lifted. So you see spikes on week nine, week 12, but back to back on week 20 and 21 that we, we figured out in retrospect that he was feeling burnt out and week 20 and week 21, he lifted above 80,000 pounds. When previously, if we look back at the weeks before that, he had not lifted more than, you know, more than 60,000 pounds in over like 10 weeks, but he just did two back-to-back -back 80,000 week pounds. So I think that was a good correlational analysis that I found that like, well, probably you just, you trained hard and you just, you're completely tapped out. And we see, you know, two weeks following that, that last 80,000 week, he, he only lifted 10,000 pounds. So there's some interesting kind of, you know, downstream effects of like, okay, you went hard for two weeks, but then, you know, you, you, you're pretty much done two weeks later. So that's, that could be important depending on what your training goals are. So, and how did we figure this out? What we did was I had, I had help with this. We looked at all of his weeks here. So this is a snapshot of his, of his Excel spreadsheet. So we have weeks going from top to bottom. Then across the row, the headers, we have volume, back squat, front, front squat, overhead squat, deadlift, snatch, clean, press, clean, and jerk. So what we did was we looked at all of his workouts every day, multiplied the reps by the weights, and we got we uh, we added up what those totals were. So then when, when we see weeks 20 and 21, we have 84,000, 82,000. Um, and we, we can see that we broke it down here. He had 6,800 of those pounds were from front squat, 30,000 pounds were from deadlift, 15,000 pounds were from snatch. That's a lot of snatching. Uh, 13,000 from clean. You know, the week after that, he had 14,000 from front squat, you know, 17,000 from clean. So we see where all that volume is coming from. So um, that's how we figured it out. So um, that analysis kind of gave him a little bit of clarity. I'm like, oh, wow, yeah, that makes sense. And now we can plan for those weeks. Um, uh, you know, during, you know, he can, he can plan how to, you know, get through those weeks and then how to plan afterwards too. Um, that was the first example. Again, looking at our programs here. Second example, I've had a, a post about this before on, on Instagram, but um, it applies here, paints the picture, I think, clear. So the second example is a, uh, a, st a strict handstand push-up progression that uh, I went through. I'm um, really the ultimate outcome, which I didn't have this as a target, but this was a, kind of the goal of the training cycle was to increase that max set of handstand push-up. So a strict handstand push-up is you flip up vertically, you're standing on your hands, and then you go, you lower yourself down, and you just push up your full body with 
only your arms, your shoulders, and triceps, basically. So there's no momentum used. It's a, it's a push-up, and what you're standing on your head. Um, so the training cycle goal was to increase that max set of push-ups. And so the training, the training target was adherence to a weekly training cycle. So a graph here I have on the screen is um, I looked at all my data. And the, in the previous four years, I'd only done five total strict handstand push-ups. But when I completed this program, which is now you know, going on two years ago, um, each month I had in November I completed 67 strict handstand push-ups. December I completed 65. In January I, I, I uh, January 18 I, cl I completed 80. So just with a formal program, working on this a little bit each week, each day, um, those reps um, piled up. And so what I noticed was by logging all my, my reps in those notebooks that I just showed, is that each week we had a gradual progression. Again, I have a graph here. X-axis are the weeks, Y-axis are the total uh, strict reps, and this is a cumulative count. So I went from 13 to 31 to 47, 72, all the way up to 217 total reps that I completed in that um, eight-week training cycle. And so we had pre-tests and post-tests in which before the training cycle began, I, had, I, I could complete eight, and then the post-test was 12, and then I had another test was 15. So I nearly doubled that strict handstand push-up with that program um, that I followed. And so that was a, just kind of a nice example that I ran those numbers on my own progress, and so I could evaluate, oh, I don't know, well, it seems like we're doing a lot of handstand push-ups, so let's, let me just track it. And I put some data to it, I'm like, oh, wow, that was pretty incredible. So, you know, that took about two, three months to figure out, but um, it was really neat for me to see that data and how how, how, how I could evaluate that program and what what does that mean for me? Oh, I could recommend that program to somebody else if I run run into someone who wants to improve their their handstand push-ups. Um, just in summary here, uh, behavioral principles can unleash performance. I talked about three different buckets here. They can be used for, for move movement, learning to develop new skills, and evaluate your programming. So um, this kind of wraps up uh, part two here. Um, and how can we unleash your performance? Now, I talked about in part one, um, I talked about uh, unleashing performance outside the box, the importance of physical activity outside the gym. That can help performance in the gym. And I just talked about in part two here um, how we can unleash performance as it relates to more movement, learning skills, evaluating that program. But there's really this analysis can be applied to looking at how effective mobility programs are. You know, there's a lot of uh, a lot of people that are on the pre-workouts and supplements. You can analyze how well those supplements are working for any any number of uh, lifts or exercises. Um, for lack of a better term, you can uh, you could evaluate how well those recovery muscle gadgety thingies are. You know, you see those those little electronic hammers that people use. You, sh you know, they feel good for sure, but is that going to be uh, correlated with any type of uh, improved? you know, performance in the gym, really, you know, I just used push-ups here as, as an example and, and a couple of different volume um, lifts, but uh, this analysis can be applied to any type of movement. It's really encouraging that, you know, looking at things through a behavioral lens can really kind of help us understand um, if our goal, if our activities are meeting our goals. And lastly, um, you know, there's different levels of coaching out there. You know, I coach people virtually. Uh, we have coaches in the gym, Mapping on our goals and how how our coaches are helping us reach those goals can really um, can really teach us a lot if we start to apply some simple pinpointing measurement feedback and reinforcement. So, um, if you have any questions about these um, about these slides or about any of this information, please feel free to reach out to me. But that wraps up part two. Um, thanks for listening. Um, again, part one was last week. Go ahead and listen to that again as a refresher. Um, talk to you guys soon. Keep moving. Till next time.